Welcome to Mobile Impact 201, Digital Content Strategies for Mobile. My name is Becky Wiegand, and I'm a Program Manager here at TechSoup. I've been with the organization for about six years, having been previously uh, spent a decade working for nonprofits in Washington, D.C. and Oakland, California, where I was usually the, <laughs> the accidental techie, where I had no tech expertise by trade, but often had to make technology decisions for the organizations I worked with. That has brought me here to TechSoup where I was a user of TechSoup services before joining the staff and now running the webinar program. Our presenter today is Amy Sample Ward who is the CEO of N10, the Nonprofit Technology Network. And they um, provide a variety of great technology resources for nonprofits including their annual conference, the Nonprofit Technology Conference each year that a lot of us attend and love. And they also run um, 501 tech clubs or organizations around the country that are local groups that help you connect with one another and meet technology experts and share your expertise and experiences. Also joining us on the back end you'll see Ali Bezdikian who is a TechSoup Interactive Events and Video Producer. She'll be on the back end to help you with any questions and flag those questions for our presenters throughout the webinar so that we can make sure that those get asked. A quick look at today's agenda. I'll do an introduction of TechSoup and the Mobile Impact webinar series for those of you who may not be familiar with us. And then I'll hand it off to Amy to take over giving us an update on the state of mobile and where we're at in using mobile technologies. And then she'll talk about mobile content strategies with mobile and social planning. She'll discuss some trends to consider and how to get started. We will have time for Q&A at the end, but feel free at any point that it moves you to do so to chat in your questions because we may have opportunities throughout to raise up some questions here and there. So TechSoup is a 501 nonprofit working toward the day when every nonprofit and social benefit organization on the planet has access to the technology knowledge and resources to work at its full potential. That includes providing events like today's webinar. We have been around since 1987 serving more than 200,000 charitable organizations in more than 60 countries around the world. We, are, we have a catalog of product donations available to you from companies like Microsoft and Cisco and Intuit. And we are continually adding to that to provide new services like consulting for technology, Windows 8.1 and QuickBooks 2014. You can find all of that and more by coming to TechSoup.org. And just a quick note about this webinar series. This is the second in our four-part Mobile Impact webinar series that we're doing with sponsorship from TechSoup, but also from Better World Wireless, PayPal, and Network for Good, where we've all kind of come together realizing that nonprofits need – and libraries – need help in figuring out how to navigate the mobile space and how to leverage mobile for your organization's benefit. So in doing that, We've provided this uh, series of webinars. This is the second today, and we have two others coming up. And so we'll provide links to those and more details toward the end. We also have a number of partners that are helping us get the word out about this series. So we want to give them credit quickly that uh, we have Social Media for Nonprofits, Volunteer Match, Mobile Beacon, N10 where Amy is from, the Case Foundation, Foundation Center, and GuideStar who are also all contributing to this series of events to help you leverage mobile for your greater impact. So with that I'd like to take a moment to invite Amy Sample Ward to join us on the line to share some of her great expertise on mobile impact and digital content strategies for mobile. Thanks so much for joining us today Amy. Welcome to the line. Thanks so much, Becky. I'm excited to be here. And I've already seen uh, one chat come in from Norman, so I'm excited to see so many folks are on the webinar and recognize that uh, I'm probably not the only person on this webinar who's tried, tried to do anything with mobile. So I really invite and remind everyone to use that chat box, not just to chat questions, but if you have an example, uh, if you've tried something that we're covering today before and are willing to share some of your experience or your knowledge, please, please, please do use that chat box to share your ideas um, and we can 
read those back or unmute your line if, if it's easier, whatever it is, I want this to be a space that is not just me having the opportunity to talk, but really anyone on here who has um, experience or ideas, please do share them. So uh, welcome and thank you for having me, and let's get started. I want to, as Becky said, share just a little bit of uh, some data for context setting, because I think um, for many of us, Something, something happens. I don't know why this happens, but I see it happen all the time. And that is that it, as individuals, we are using our phones, many of which are smartphones, uh, all the time. You know, we're at home, we're using our phone, we're maybe on the bus on the way to work, we're using our phone, and then we show up at our nonprofits and we walk into our office and sit down at our desk and put our phone over on the side and then go into this uh, place where we kind of pretend that phones don't exist. And we think, okay, you know, I'm going to at work today craft the most beautiful email message that I can, and I'm going to send it out. And you know, every single one of our uh, subscribers is going to read this email in full, and that's going to be it. You know, we, we put all of this energy into to certain pieces of content and certain pieces of communication and forget that our subscribers, our supporters, are just like us and using our phones all the time to read email, but also to engage in social media um, and, and to really use the web. So I want to share some context about how much the web is being used through mobile phones and other, um, just a couple other data points to remind us all that we should be thinking about phones while we're at work and not, um, you know, not treating ourselves differently than, than our supporters are probably treating our content. So a few notes from – so this is data as of uh, January of this year. Um, I'm sure that there is even more recent data, and, and I'm happy if you are looking for specific data that is maybe more aligned with your cause or your mission, feel free to let me know, uh, and I'm happy to help make sure you have uh, data that's appropriate for your use. So 90% of American adults generally have a mobile phone, and 58% uh, have a smartphone. So I'm guessing, like I said, that a number of folks on the webinar today probably fall in this category and have a smartphone. 32% of American adults own an e-reader, so that's like a, a Kindle. And 42% have a tablet. So something that they're doing much more than e-reading on, but are um, you know, accessing the web, using apps, all those kinds of things. And here's just a trend map over time. I think it's helpful to see all of these kind of against each other, how different tools are getting adopted. Um, and something to really highlight here, I often get questions about this, but you can see that that the orange looking uh, dots and lines are related to a game console. So for, uh, as you can see on here, you know, a good number of people actually have game consoles that are Internet enabled and are, um, actually serve as portals to browsing the web, um, often accessing other applications, not just other games. So all of these different um, technologies kind of play into a whole ecosystem of opportunities for individual people to be accessing your content. But what's most important to note is that all of these pieces have very different screen sizes and very different optimal uh, viewing settings. So if you've crafted a really beautiful campaign message, but it's mostly text, and you have folks pulling up that message um, on a, a game console or a smart, uh, smart device that's using a TV screen as its display, oh my gosh, I'm sure that no one is going to read that. I wouldn't be able to read you know, um, a text-heavy text campaign message on a huge blown up screen. So this um, combination of, of media, text and pictures and video and all those other pieces coming together really starts to make sense when you think about how many different sizes uh, and access, access points people may be using to review that, that content. So here's a note um, just about you know, people with cell phones going online and what isn't indicated here, um, but I can 
tell you from this same report is that 34% of people said that they use their mobile phone uh, more than any other device to go on the Internet. So it is mostly their Internet provider, 34% of people, um, which is, uh, I think, for many folks, kind of a surprising number that that's their primary access point uh, to the Internet. But even though we are talking about um, folks using their phones to go online and browse the web and read your emails and download apps, it is important for nonprofits to remember that the primary activity for most people on a phone is to send and receive text messages. Um, and I think that there are plenty of examples out there of organizations who have incorporated uh, text messaging into their kind of messaging and content plan for their organization and um, have found great ways not just to do text to give, which I know will be covered in the next webinar in this series with, with other fundraising um, tactics, but really to engage people, to remind them of a call to action or to uh, you know, keep them engaged in, in ways that are you know, pretty lightweight just through a, a text message. So there are definitely opportunities not just to try and think about mobile as a place where you have to develop an app um, or you know, is, is a web-only space, but really text messages are still a huge, huge portion of what we are doing with those devices. And here's a breakdown for, so these are going to only be smartphones. Um, iOS is the iPhone series, and Android would be any, um, any different make or model um, that's using the Android operating system. So here's a breakdown of how people are spending their time on those phones. Um, you, can, you can see that Facebook has a large enough uh, percentage of time that it's getting a pretty hefty, hefty chunk of that pie chart there. Um, but also important to note are there's various pieces um, that add up to um, just web, web browsers. So there's Google browsers, Apple Safari, uh, et cetera. So those are people you know, that are not inside of an app um, or inside of a game, you know, but they are really getting content on the web similar as they would on a desktop on their, on their phone. So of course to that question then of that balance between time spent in apps or on the mobile web, um, here's a pretty clear, clear chart. Um, but just a reminder that that doesn't mean you have to have an app in order to engage with people. So um, you know, as we saw, if I can not make anybody seasick by going back a slide, um, you know, uh, let me grab my little arrow. It's not letting me grab that, but that's okay. Um, everyone can see that Facebook is right there on the right side with 17%. Twitter with one and a half. Social messaging, thank you, Becky. <laughs> Social messaging, um, otherwise nine and a half. YouTube, 4%. All of those channels are showing up here you know, as people spending time um, in that application, but there's content in that application from you. You can be engaging on Facebook you could, uh, or you know, other social messaging tools. You could have some great YouTube videos that are maybe even you know, linked to from an email that you send out to folks you know, encouraging them to watch this video. So um, I don't want anyone to look at this chart and think 86% of time is spent in apps. Well, we need to develop an app. That's not the case. What that's really saying is that people are using existing channels where they already know there's a lot of different people or a lot of different content, and that's where they're spending their time. So it really does reinforce that it's um, a great opportunity for you to go to those places where your community is already engaged instead of necessarily trying to create another space for them to know about and download and try and engage with. Um, I hope that makes sense. And so here's a chart that just kind of um, illustrates what we've been getting at here, that, that folks are uh, using their 
phones for the web, um, and even 34%, like I said before, indicating that they use their mobile phone as their primary Internet access point. And so uh, it's, it's right at the very edge on the right side of the chart, but you can see that um, total mobile app usage has taken over just slightly now on uh, desktop usage. So that certainly is the trend that these other devices, be, be that a tablet or a phone, um, are, are taking over in a, in a pretty lasting way how we're, using, how we're using the Internet. And then one note here from our um, Every year we do the Benchmarks Report with MNR Strategic Services. It's totally free uh, to download, and it covers primarily um, email and list information, so um, advocacy and fundraising as well as just general community or, or newsletter type content, so break, breaking that down by open rates and click-throughs and um, you know, the, the number of times messages are sent, etc. But we do include a section on social media, um, and that includes some mobile numbers. And so I wanted to include this as just um, kind of a general guideline to help give you some perspective, at least of the organizations that we have have access to in this research each year. So for every 1,000 email subscribers, so for every 1,000 people that you have you know, in your database, it, on average, this is not going to be uh, you know, empirical, but on average that means you have uh, 199 Facebook fans and 110 Twitter followers and 13 mobile subscribers. And that does not mean 13 people who are reading you know, your Facebook posts or reading your emails on their phone, but 13 people who have given you their cell phone number to subscribe directly to, to text, text content from you. Um, and we will get more to, to that in a little bit. But just as a general rule, and helpful also to give many organizations perspective, you know, oh my gosh, we've got 10,000 people you know, in, our, in our database, and I only have this many Twitter followers. Well, for many organizations, that average um, you know, really is uh, a pretty small piece. So if you're, doing, if you're doing better than that, then you can – this is your, your good congratulations for the day. You can go share with your team that you're way ahead of the average. So I'm just going to move ahead. Um, if you do have questions about any of that data, or like I said, if, if you've been looking for some mobile data that's um, maybe specific to your, um, your organization or, or your, the, the community that you work with, feel free to send me an email anytime. I'm happy to make sure you have uh, data that can help make your case whatever it is you're trying to work on. So diving into some planning, because as I mentioned, you, know, you really want to fold mobile into how you think about all this other social engagement and, and um, community outreach and your communications, etc. First step is to review that content. So of course, you know, what, what content do you want to have? But what I think is most important is what content do you already have? Do you already have um, you know, calls to action that could be easily translated into uh, an SMS, a text message that people could respond to? Or, or are your calls to action, do they really require people you know, be at their computer and can sit down and read that uh, you know, message? So figuring out which pieces of content and calls to action you have, and of course, what channels are you already using that content in? You know, have you learned something from that? Have you seen that that content really does work well on Facebook, but it just hasn't been working well you know, maybe on your website? Um, and that can tell you a lot about where, where to go next. Um, I, this is one of my um, extremely um, high, high, highly uh, designed um, graphs. I'm, I'm going to launch my career as a designer, of course. Um, so the point here is, is really just to remind us, even though we are talking about mobile, which is a, you know, a tool, and we are talking a lot about our content, that 
those two things don't get to decide what you do, and they're, they're not necessarily going to indicate um, whether you're going to be successful or not. Ultimately, you need to know what your goal is and have that goal be in direct relation to the people that you're trying to communicate with or, or that you're working with directly. And those people and your goal are the most important pieces before you ever talk about mobile or SMS messages or anything else. Um, really figuring out who the people are uh, and, and what they need from you and, and what you want to do with them, what you want to call them to do is key. And from there, when you are looking at these tools and content pieces, you can focus on the people because you know that you have now you know, kind of sunk your goal in with them. And you can look to them to say, are these people who uh, are on their phones? Are these people who are maybe you know, heavily in Facebook on their phone? Are they more um, you know, text message focused? Are they you know, using their phone for everything? Uh, and then what content makes sense? based on the way they are using those tools. And let the tools and the content decisions really follow from the people that you are working with and not just um, you know, the content that you want to post to that channel. And I think for many folks this is uh, what content planning meetings feel like in their organization. Um, so many different questions emerge. So I wanted to share just a really simple template for planning out some content uh, for your organization that you can use in an ongoing way as a resource across the organization. So the first part of any content map is identifying the content that you have. And again, this is all, all the different pieces of content you have. You're not saying in this content map that all content goes everywhere, but we're going to get to that in the next uh, couple slides. The first step is, is having an understanding of all of those different types of content that you are currently creating or that you may be creating, um, may be creating soon. So that you don't create a content map, share it with everyone on staff so everyone knows you know, certain types of content work best uh, wherever, and then you go to your next staff meeting and someone says, oh, now we have all of this content, you know, and you haven't planned for that. So you really want to categorically cover all of those different departments. And the more the more nuanced or granular you can be, the better. This is of course uh, pretty generic um, and pretty high level buckets because it's just here um, to provide some examples and context. But ultimately um, you might not just say any of our program updates. You might say, um, you know, using N10 as an example, um, Tech Club updates, so updates about our local offline events versus online education program updates, versus our conference updates. So the more specific you can be, the better. From there, of course, as we showed in that previous um, slide, you want to make sure that goals are a central piece of this. So listing out goals for why you are actually you know, posting that type of content, um, why you create that content in the first place uh, is key for you to know how to frame it, how to position it, and, and who in your community to post it to. And a reminder that sometimes you have a piece of content that has multiple goals. You know, promoting, uh, for example, um, program news about, our, about the NTC, about N10's conference, is of course trying to get at the second goal here of increasing participation in the conference, um, but it may also be to find sponsors or partners because we've you know, promoted that there's something new going on about the conference. So you don't have to you know, winnow down to just one goal for every piece of content, um, but including the relevant goals in this content map when you share it across your staff can help everyone feel like they know why that content exists and why it gets shared. And then the third piece is figuring out all of those different outlets uh, that you have access to. What, you know, so separating um, SMS messages from an email newsletter that maybe, and we can talk about this, you've, you've mobile optimized um, you know, every different uh, social media channel that you use. And a reminder here that if you do any work with a coalition, with an organizational partner, uh, maybe even with a funder, and those other organizations have 
a Facebook page or have an email newsletter. This is a great opportunity in your kind of infrastructure of content planning um, to include and identify who all those partner networks are so that when you are thinking about you know, releasing an update about your conference and you know that you have three, you know, three funders who have Facebook pages too, you can reach out to them and include them uh, and, and help kind of widen, widen the field. So this is what it looks like. And you can get um, a very simple template. That URL on your screen right now is case sensitive, so you'll need to do the DIY as a capital. Um, just a note, because inevitably there's always folks who say it's, uh, it's not working. Um, and at N10, we use X's and O's and blanks. You can use whatever system you like. You can make it much more sophisticated with colors, whatever you would like to do. Uh, but the point here for us is that X's are yeses, zeros are maybes, and a blank is a no. So for us, if we have information about an upcoming conference uh, or, or event, and we know that the reason we want to post about it is for visibility um, and to get more people to register, um, we know that we're, every time we're going to post about it to Twitter. And we know we're going to post about it on our blog. Because on your blog, as everyone knows, you have much more room to write about your event. And then Twitter, you can uh, point people to that blog post where there's more information. Um, but we've listed the newsletter as a maybe, because timing-wise, maybe it doesn't make sense to try and include it in the newsletter, uh, or maybe it does. So that's how we use this as a guide. And of course, welcome you to improve on it. Um, and if you make it better, please share it back so that we can also learn from your improvements. I'm going to pause just for a second because I think there has been um, some questions, and I just want to check in with Becky really quick. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, we have had a couple of questions come in. So one person, uh, Wendy, asked, um, so I think the smartest thing we can do is figure out how to engage our constituents with or on existing apps. So going back to that app discussion. And she mm -hmm. asked specifically, for example, how can we reach millennials on apps that they already use? So is there a way to design your content so that if, you know, rather than creating your own organizational app, which may be not yep. fruitful, um, how can you target millennials on apps that they are already using? Mm -hmm. Great question. So for channels where you maybe already have a, a profile like Facebook or, or YouTube, and I suggest those two because they're, they're just so commonly used. And if you are not using either of those, that is fine. Um, but you know, if you already have a page on Facebook or a channel on YouTube, you can click into your analytics and see um, on your different videos on YouTube or, or different pieces of content or updates on Facebook what the demographic breakdown is of people who are engaging with you uh, regularly. And I think it's really helpful when, just to use Enten as an example again, we've seen certain uh, videos of ours on our YouTube channel um, are getting most engagement by um, like a 45 to 55 year old uh, age group is the, is the predominant one, the, the highest one. And yet, that same video on Facebook has a at 25 to 35 is the highest group. And so for us, that didn't mean the video, you know, the content itself isn't engaging with millennials. It was figuring out which channel you know, certain age groups are on where they are interested in a video you know, versus maybe if we embedded that video just in other channels and um, could, could put it on the blog, and maybe that hit a different group. So I think remembering that sometimes it isn't just that channel and who's there. It's which pieces of your content on that channel engage with those groups. Um, looking at Facebook's you know, data or other um, major social networks, there are people of every age group on every <laughs> platform. Um, it's just are those people in your community using Facebook in that way, or are they not? You know, there are some organizations that find Facebook is such a, a you know, huge and valuable piece of their engagement, and other organizations say, you know, our folks really don't use Facebook that way. Our folks are much more private on Facebook. You know, they're using it for photos of their kids or engaging with their with their friends and, and not really engaging with organizations. So it's more about figuring out which pieces of your content 
do engage those people, and then getting more of that content uh, into that space. Um, I know that's probably a, a cop out of an answer because it just means we have to follow, follow the data and do some investigation. Um, but ultimately, there's no silver bullet, unfortunately, because com you know, every organization's supporters can be so different. Very true. <laughs> That's very true. And so Google <laughs> Analytics is one that we use as well here at TechSoup. Mm -hmm. And it does provide uh, a lot of depth of data. Like you can really get deep into, into seeing what kind of activity people are doing and where and how and who they are. So um, I would also second that recommendation. We had um, a couple of other questions that came in. Okay. But let's just take one more for now, and then we'll move forward. Okay. Um, so Perfect. Daniel asked, um, and this is going back a little bit to the, the statistic about how many people are using their phones and that most are okay. still using it for text. He asked, yep. is there a site or software that you can recommend to text and engage your customers, so a, an SMS platform that you would recommend? Yes, there are quite a few actually. And I think um, I'm, I'm happy to follow up with some links that maybe you guys could include in the follow-up email, but I'm hesitant to make a direct recommendation because when, when selecting a tool for that, you're going to want to consider what database you have. Um, if, if you can you know, directly connect it into the central database you're already using, that will be so much easier because you'll be able to track you know, and send an email to folks who just received a text message, for example, um, instead of having two separate databases. So that's one consideration. And then the other is if you plan to only do um, communications or if you do plan at any time to add in the fundraising element, that will make you, um, you know, maybe consider certain tools over others. So I think because of that, I'm, I'm more comfortable maybe Becky sending to you a, a list of some resources um, that folks can review knowing that they're going to want to bring some questions to that analysis. Absolutely. That would be great. And I'm sure we can also okay. put together some resources to include in the follow-up email. Yeah. Um, and just Perfect. as a note, the webinar that we have coming up on June 19th, the third part of the mobile series that we're doing is on uh, raising funds and money through mobile. So it will include a big section that's on um, particularly not just engagement, but on donations through things like text mm -hmm. platforms. Perfect. So why don't we go ahead and move forward. We have a Great. couple of other questions that have come in, but we can hold those for the next pause. Thanks. Okay. Perfect. Yep. This next layer, so we've now reviewed our content, and we've now created a content map, and everyone in our organization knows what content we create and which channels we send it to, and it's a you know, beautiful thing of glory. Um, so now we're going to talk just really briefly about reviewing our programs. Um, not every program that you do needs to you know, have some connection to mobile. Um, and also, not every uh, program that you do now needs to, needs to necessarily um, find other channels that it, it – you know, everything you're doing now is not broken, is my point. Um, some of what you are doing is great, and in some of your programs you may have an opportunity to not necessarily change too much of your uh, structure of that program, but it, there may be an opportunity to layer mobile into that. Um, so a few uh, examples. First the, is a, a great organization. They work with young people. And I think anytime you are trying to um, work directly with and not just advocate for young people, looking at including SMS um, can be a really huge piece for engagement for them. And um, the Alliance for Climate Education, which is based in San Francisco, right near TechSoup's office actually, um, is a great example of doing this well. So they have um, in-school presentations. Um, sometimes that's in a classroom. Sometimes it's in an assembly. Um, but, but they have trained educators who go into schools um, and they are putting on presentations um, not kind of in a theoretical sense about um, climate action and, and taking, taking actions in a, in a pretty local small scale, but they are really giving um, kids in those schools examples of things they can do in their school or in their, uh, in their own homes to 
save money, make things more cost efficient, um, you know, save energy, but also you know, maybe green the school or uh, make it a, a more environmentally friendly space. And after they give these presentations and, and help you know, kind of get the kids excited and, and really inspired to take some of these small actions that you know, when thousands and thousands of kids are taking them adds up to so much change, uh, they ask everyone to send a text message to their short code with that thing they're going to do. They call it Do One Thing. Um, and so they can send in a text message that's, you know, I'm going to change all of our light bulbs to energy efficient ones. Or I'm going to create a you know, team at my school um, that organizes to paint our roof white, you know, paint the roof of, of the school white. Whatever that text may be. And now that they've texted in, you know, they can opt in to continue hearing from the organization. And they can, similar to the way many of us in our organizations have um, email campaigns, you know, so anyone who is new gets a welcome email, for example, they can have a similar kind of engagement uh, process that those kids are kicked into where three weeks later they get a text that says, hey, it's the Alliance for Climate Education. Have you put that team together? You know, have you done that one thing, or do you need help? So if, you do, if they write back in a text message that says they do need help, they can send them a link to their website where they have toolkits and resources for how to take these actions. Um, so it's just a, a great example of not changing the way you know, their idea of this do one thing. It doesn't change the way they deliver those in-classroom programs. And it also doesn't change their goals of getting young people to take these actions and, and to follow through. It just plays up a channel opportunity that really gets those people uh, engaged um, using, using a text message right in the classroom when they're thinking about it so they can follow up with them later. And another example of you know, a program that's not trying to be created all anew but just expanding for mobile um, is Planned Parenthood of uh, Orange and San Bernardino counties where they had already invested in a um, support line with um, health educators where you could um, call them or, or do an online chat to ask some questions that maybe you didn't feel comfortable coming into the clinic in person and asking um, or you know, didn't really know who else to ask. And with SMS, they're able to expand that and have one additional channel that doesn't doesn't require more health educators. It doesn't require a different you know, knowledge base. It just means that people could call, or they could do an online chat, or they could send an SMS and reach that many more people, provide that many more answers to questions, but again, just make it feel even more accessible because there are more angles to ask that same health educator uh, important questions. So I'll pause before I jump into the communications piece. Um, Becky, any questions you want to throw in here, or should I do this one more slide? Um, well, we did have some other questions. One person just okay. asked specifically how you feel about Instagram in general when we're talking about the different channels. Uh huh. I think Instagram is a really um, interesting platform. It has a lot of potential. Um, what I actually see happening, and maybe it's because it's um, you know, in comparison to things like Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, you know, is more relatively new. Um, I don't see, or there are of course organizations who are getting a lot of engagement in Instagram um, and you know, have good follower numbers and are getting lots of um, likes on their photos, etc. But what I've seen more examples of are organizations using other platforms like. Twitter or even their website, and calling for photo content with a hashtag. And because you know, a hashtag is becoming fairly ubiquitous across the web now, um, you know, just encouraging people to use that hashtag and pull photos from Instagram. So you could have you know, a gallery up on your website for your campaign where those photos were posted, but they didn't need to know that the organization had its own Instagram account, or they didn't need to follow you know, the organization's Instagram account to participate, but they saw, um, I don't know, just to make up an example, like if N10 said, you know, 
everybody take photos of the oldest piece of technology in your office or something, you know, and, and people were taking funny photos in their offices and posting them to Instagram. Some may post them to Twitter. Some may post them to Facebook. But if you included that hashtag, you know, N10 is that organizing group could easily pull all those different photos and tweets and posts uh, and pull them into one place. So I think it's a really great uh, tool for getting people to post rich content because photos are naturally more engaging than, than text. But it isn't necessarily a channel I think that requires you – know, that doesn't – success does not mean you have followers on Instagram. Does that make sense what I'm saying at all? It does. The engagement matters okay. more than the followers or the likes. <laughs> yeah. um, and one clarification question. Ryan asks about this Planned Parenthood um, image that we have on the screen right here. Do you know what the software was that they used or what the – their call chat text tool is? Um, the last time I talked to them, I did not ask if they were using the same software. So I'm happy to follow up with them um, and ask what, what tool they're using. Great. That would, be, that would be helpful. And we can follow up directly with you, Ryan, afterwards um, if we get that answer. Cool. Great. So let's go ahead and move us forward. Thanks. Awesome. Sure. And this next one we're getting smaller and smaller number of slides for each of these sections. And this is just a reminder now that we've really talked about the content pieces and the way uh, that programs may be supplemented with the inclusion of mobile, um, is to review the actual communications that go into that. So recognizing that if you're sending out um, you know, uh, an email and it's pointing to all these different channels, but you, you may see in your Google Analytics or your email newsletter um, statistics that you have, uh, you know, N10 has over, over a third of our subscribers are reading our emails, including our newsletters, um, on a mobile device, whether that be a tablet or a, a phone. And so if we're then, you know, including all of these links to other places, what does that experience look like? So really thinking not just, you know, well, we've added in um, SMS or we've found that you know, we have a bunch of folks on Facebook who are, are using Facebook on their phone. So how, how are your communications reflective of a, a good experience throughout you know, every piece of content or, or clicking through every call to action you provide? Um, so it isn't just a matter of, of knowing that they're using those devices, but, but giving yourself a chance to review what your communications look like in that space. Um, and you know, as, as Becky said, Google Analytics is a great place um, to, to learn a little bit more about how folks are using your website. So in the interest of time, because I know everyone already has these slides, I'm going to skip these couple trends, and I want to spend a few minutes talking about how you can get started with all of this today. Uh, I hope that's okay. I'm happy to talk about trends anytime. Send me an email. I think that's great. Uh, or, okay, excellent. So just a few, a few things that are hopefully somewhat tangible and not overwhelming. So first is to, you know, I know that everyone is going to have like a bajillion pages of your website, and some of them you don't even know exist, and then one day someone emails you and says, this you know, page is out of date, and you're like, well, of course it is. I never knew it existed. Um, so I, I'm not trying to advocate that tomorrow you have redone your entire website or reviewed every page of it, but that you have focused on your forms and your sign-up pages so that people who are – you know, maybe on Facebook, on a, on a tablet, or on a phone, and they you know, click through to your organization because they just love your Facebook content and they want to donate to you, or they want to um, you know, sign up for your newsletter or, or your emails, that when they do that, it is not so wonky and ridiculous and ugly that they are unable to complete the form. So make sure that those um, donation pages and you know, subscription pages have only the necessary details, only the pieces you absolutely do need, like their email address or their credit card number or you know, just the bare bones. Because you can always follow up in an email that says, great, you're in. If you want to add to your profile, click here or something. Um, but really just collect what's necessary. Um, and think about how they get to that page. You know, is your 
uh, donate or your sign up button on the home page and you know that that's how they are getting there, or are they getting there uh, through some navigation on your site? If that's the case, you really might want to make it you know, an easy navigation from a phone. Next is to think about those actual email templates. Um, I think for many organizations, um, creating a fully responsive, completely redesigned website um, is not an easy thing to uh, you know, set aside the budget for and, and um, make time on staff to do. But if you can already focus on your forms and your sign-up pages, and you can really make sure that your emails are coming through in a, in a legible way regardless of what size screen people are on, it will go a long way to making it an, an easy, easy space for people to continue actually reading your content. I mean, it's not too difficult to make your emails um, look nice on a smaller screen. The first is, you know, I know many organizations, especially for your newsletters, have you know, a kind of hard template that you put new content into every month. And many of those have two columns, so al almost mirroring your website in a way where you have something on, the, on one side and then you have a column of, of your main text. Those are really difficult to make responsive because they are um, you know, trying to put a, ta a table into that space. So looking at how to really have just one column in your emails can help right away. And then I think there's a lot that can be A-B tested or you know, try two different versions and see which works. Um, but something that we have seen work from any organization is a call-out button. So something that's uh, an image that's a you know, larger text and makes that call to action really clear so that even if on their phone they're not reading the whole message, they do see the big call out button and they want to click on that and go straight to that donate page or uh, you know, go watch that video. It's easy to do. And of course, make the calls to action in the email really easy to scan. If you're just you know, kind of browsing through your phone and you can see it in bold with a link, uh, it's so much easier to notice than when you have this really long email you know, on your tiny screen. I know for many organizations we feel like you know, we, think, we think we know how people are reading content, or we think we know which pages are most popular on the website, but going into Google Analytics can really help you know that for sure. Um, and that doesn't just mean you look at which pages are um, kind of in aggregate most popular, but you can see how people are getting to those pages, or you know, what, what pages are they finally leaving because they never found that information about volunteering, for example. So look at the visitor flow. You can also set up some campaigns so that if you know that you're going to be pointing people to a certain uh, page in your next email or even in an SMS, um, it can help track how people uh, migrated through after that call to action. And you can really learn a lot about maybe where, where to focus on some web improvements on the site. And of course you can see um, which devices uh, people are using to come to your website, whether that's their phone or, or tablet or um, desktop computer, etc. And then last, not that there are no more ways to get started, but um, hopefully one more piece that's somewhat approachable, and that is trying to set up in your organization a a culture that's open to testing some of these things. With mobile, there's so much to test and learn um, for many organizations because it just hasn't been a part of our communications toolkit. So don't, don't feel like you have to have this perfect plan for how you're going to include uh, you know, advocacy messages in your, you know, through SMS. Um, you really want to have uh, a space where you can talk about this with your whole staff, encourage people across the organization to you know, talk about, oh, you know, I don't know why we haven't thought about Instagram. I use it all the time, and you know, all my friends use it. What if we could test using Instagram? So encourage people to talk about how they use these tools, because ultimately, like I said at the very beginning, we do know a lot more 
than, than we think we do. We just show up to the office and then tell ourselves you know, to kind of forget everything we did until we showed up that morning. So really encourage staff to try things and, and participate in uh, whatever pilot you may set up. And of course, if you can, and, I, and always happy to share from N10 how we do this, create a standard process so that any staff person who maybe has an idea of something they want to test or a new channel that they think could work for the organization has a path for making that suggestion um, and, and can surface it with folks who may want to engage in that pilot with them. So I know we have just like three minutes, I think, for questions. Um, Becky, any, any that you want to highlight? Sure. Well, we had one person who asked um, specifically, Nancy wanted to know what your thoughts are about Pinterest since we already talked a little bit okay. about Instagram and some of the other ones, um, and how to use that channel to engage people mobily. Sure. So Pinterest is another um, social platform that certainly has a lot of um, non-desktop computer usage. <laughs> um, it uh, lends itself really well actually to uh, tablets and, and smartphones. Um, it has a pretty specific demographic of users. So if, you're, um, if you are already using Pinterest and, and finding it to be successful, then that's great. Um, if you are already using it and not finding it to be successful, that is also okay. Uh, if you're not quite sure, you, know, um, I, I, you can give it a test. But I think um, it can be similar to Instagram where it's such a, a photo-rich, of course, place and something easy that people can you know, really quickly browse through and, and engage with. Um, a couple notes I see that Nancy asked about the demographics. So it's um, depending on um, the, the time. I've seen stats that show a range, um, but it is very heavily uh, female users and um, slightly older. So not like, I, I mean, old is a funny word because we all have an image of what we think old means, but um, you know, some, where some social platforms are really heavy on the 18-year-old end of things, Pinterest is a bit uh, older than that, <laughs> of course. So I think, it's, um, I think it can be an interesting place if you know that you, know, you have a certain uh, type of supporter and they really engage there. Um, but about 80% or so, I've seen different demographic or different statistics on this, uh, a great number of posts on Pinterest are just getting repinned. So it's less about original content and more just about taking content that may already be in the Pinterest ecosystem and reorganizing it into new boards. So again, um, I think if you're trying to get more content into there, it's, it's a bit harder. But if you're really just trying to engage people, it could be a good space. Great. And you know, one of our participants, Norman, just commented that, and I think this is a valuable piece to think about, is that um, you can risk trying to be in too many channels and at one time and not doing a great job in any of them. So that really does speak to the need to, to look at your analytics and really target where your audience is already at and work in those channels as your starting place, especially if you're just getting started. That that's, uh, mm -hmm. you, know, you don't need to be in all of them at all the time, especially if you don't have your audiences there. Mm -hmm. um, we also had a question uh, Alyssa asked from your last slide when you talked about creating an environment for testing. She asked, could you share your organization's process for new channel suggestions? Like how do you add those to the process? If somebody mm -hmm. says, oh, we want to do this new cool thing on Tumblr, um, how mm -hmm. do you determine if that's worth your time? For us, we, we first do a review of who is on that channel. Um, so for, for N10, you know, we are often sharing nonprofit technology related content. <laughs> That's what we do. Um, so if we're thinking about a new channel, we'll um, you know, go to that channel and do some searches for nonprofit technology or NP tech or uh, prominent people from our community. Like we would look up TechSoup. You know, have they, do they have a profile that we could learn from? Um, so we, we first just try and test what is there. You know, if, if we do a search for NP Tech and see a certain number of returns, well, are they all images? Are they all videos? Are they all blog posts? You know, what, what can we learn just 
from what's already on that channel. Um, and then we actually like to be really honest and forward with the community and say, you know, either post it on another channel if that seems relevant, or uh, you know, put it out to the membership committee, or, or do different things to say, hey, we were thinking of using this channel. We saw there's a lot of content there. Um, you know, do you think N10 should have a profile? If we did, how would you want to engage with us? Um, so get some direct feedback. And only then would we set up an actual profile and start testing it ourselves. Um, I think it's important to learn what you can about a new channel before you set up your profile so that you already know, you know, oh gosh, it looks like a lot of people have you know, this kind of uh, information in their profile, or people have focused on this kind of content. Um, so that you don't set it up and then have this kind of bare bones profile and not know what to put on it. Yeah, it saves you from being the uh, noob as we like to yeah, say exactly. in the Internet terms, of embarrassing yourself by not knowing how the community that's already there is interacting and working. Exactly. Well, this is great. Um, we are almost out of time, so I want to go ahead okay. and move us forward quickly just to talk a little bit since Better World Wireless is one of our sponsors of this event. I just want to quickly tell you a little bit about the program that they offer through TechSoup. They are a wireless no uh, offer that they make through TechSoup, and they are a nonprofit. Um, and they offer discounted mobile services and devices to nonprofits, charities, and public libraries throughout the United States. And you can find more information about their program and their offers at TechSoup.org slash BetterWorldWireless. Feel free to go there if you are looking for more about mobile. They have discounted mobile devices that you can get for your staff. So if you are looking to have some organizationally owned and distributed mobile phones for your staff, and if you are looking to have um, mobile service for your staff, um, and it extends to staff throughout your organization, and it's discounted. And they also donate a portion of the proceeds from each of those mobile plans to Social Good as well. So it is a B Corp good organization that we like to support. So I know that we had a couple of questions we may not have had time to get to, so we'd like to invite you to go to our forums. We have a mobile and wireless community forum on TechSoup's site where if you have additional questions, you can come there and ask them. We have a variety of experts and tech consultants and nonprofit users who would share their expertise and help answer questions for you. Um, and I'd also like to invite you to the upcoming webinar. So I mentioned that this is part of a four-part series. Um, we have two others in this series that are coming up. One is How to Raise More Money Via Mobile. So for those of you looking for specific information about text services or mobile fundraising, mobile donation platforms, uh, mobile survey programs, things like that where you can also collect donations, this would be the webinar to come to on June 19th where we have um, Network for Good and PayPal experts to come and share their expertise. Um, and then the last one is on July 10th where we'll be talking about mobile technology for offices and people. We'll spend time talking about things like mobile policies in your office and what kind of devices, whether you want to allow your staff to bring their own devices to work and leverage the use of them for your organization. So we'll talk about that. You can find all of these events including next week's event which is about getting technology donations through TechSoup. So if you are not familiar with our programs and want to learn more about the donations you can receive through TechSoup's programs, that's a great one to come to. You can find all of these on our website at TechSoup.org slash community slash events dash webinars. With that, I'd like to thank you, Amy, for the great presentation. Again, folks, look for the email later on today with the full recording and slide deck so you can review it and share it at your convenience. Lastly, I'd like to thank Allie for helping manage chat questions on the back end, and ReadyTalk, our webinar platform sponsor, who provides the use of this program for us to present these webinars to you on a regular basis. Please take a moment when you close your window. A new window will open up on one of your browsers that will have a post-event survey. Take a moment to let us know how we did today so we can continue to improve our webinar programming. Five is excellent, one is poor. So take a minute and give us your thoughts. Thank you so much everyone, and have a terrific day.